not live. Let's see if that does the trick. We'll give it just a moment here, waiting to see if um, the camera and video will display. So just give me one moment. Oh, there we go. Okay. So like I was saying, welcome to all of you guys and thank you so much for making it into the room today. My name is Josh Crow. I'm the owner and founder of this company, Sunpath Financial, a retirement and wealth management firm in Newport Beach, California. You know, obviously all of you came here today to learn about Social Security, but while we're on that topic, I'd also like to encourage you to join our other classes. You know, we talk on Medicare, estate planning, retirement income, retirement and taxes. And there are really five core components, and all of those are based around retirement. Now, the reason we created these classes has nothing to do with such as us sitting down and helping you file a Medicare or Social Security application, but more so to do with our core service here, which is retirement planning. And so each one of those topics we touch on help get you guys the education you need and align yourself with a specialist so that you make sure you're getting the best of each one of those. For instance, when it comes to Medicare, there are several different plan types, but you want to make sure you get a foundational education so when you're talking to a specialist, you're getting aligned with the right one. Now, all that does come back to us as a retirement planning firm because when we're building those plans, we're taking income, expenses, assets, and liabilities uh, to build it. And we want to make sure that obviously you're maximizing in each one of those areas. Now, you're more than welcome to join any of those classes. We do hold them uh, every other week. We hold a webinar on at least one of those. So just uh, no different than you did with this webinar. Click to join us. Uh, I want to get uh, you guys some background before we get started on myself and the firm that I have started here. So for me, I've been uh, in the industry now for about 15 years. Uh, I actually got pulled into it by my grandfather who started a tax business 50 years ago. So, you know, far before my time, uh, he was asking of myself and brother it was a family business uh, to come and work in the bit, you know, there and help with administrative tasks such as, you know, filing and inputting of client information. Now, at one point in time, when we become of age, uh, 18, we went out and acquired our licenses and we began to prepare individual and corporate tax returns. For me, I got a little bit more curious about something called above the line deductions, which many of you may be familiar with. If you're not, join my retirement and tax class where I'll uh, guide you through that. But anyways, there's an area called IRAs in there, individual retirement account. It's built for retirement savings. Most of you uh, listening today would have one or some experience with it. Uh, and so that's when I realized I could help folks accumulate their assets uh, as opposed to reducing their liabilities with taxes. And I was drawn to that. Joined a large firm uh, down in Irvine, California and got my feet wet there. Uh, was really mentored by guys that have been in the industry for 35 plus years. It was a lot to take in, but uh, took it well in those first several years and uh, eventually kind of found my way into retirement planning there. You know, it's a very large full service firm where they have, you know, PNC and health and life insurance and a variety of different service types. Uh, but for me, I really had a knack for retirement planning. I loved getting into the software and bringing a client's information into that system and then turning all of that, what seemed to be higher, you know, hieroglyphics uh, to client into a language they could understand and really help build a plan that was sustainable and reliable, dependable for their lifetime. That's the key here for retirement. We're making sure that we put clients and build something that's going to last for the rest of their retirement. We're talking 30 uh, plus years here. So uh, that was my story there. And then uh, eventually realized it would be better for me uh, to focus in on retirement with my own firm instead of having those other services attached to the name I was working for, uh, SunPath Financial is dedicated solely to retirement planning and wealth management. And so uh, started this here five years ago in Newport. We are on uh, Irvine Avenue and uh, South Bristol Street, right off the 73 in Newport Beach. Very proud here, obviously, as you can tell with the passion and excitement being in here on the webinars today. I had a couple of cool accolades along the way, wrote a retirement book in that first year, uh, took about four months off 
uh, you know, production and went ahead and did that. Uh, that was more so tailored for federal employees, but the advice is fundamental uh, and applies to all retirees. We'll be working on a uh, more of a general uh, retirement book here in the near future. Uh, after that was published in Forbes for top 25 retirement articles of the year. That was 2019. Uh, and then also received top production uh, for one of our liaisons, uh, a relationship between ourselves and the large insurance carriers, which we'll use for life insurance and long-term care for clients, uh, went on to uh, receive you know, top production in the U.S. actually there in uh, 2019 as well. So as far as personal life, I'm trying to get more active and out of the business now uh, more than ever and just engage with the community and, and connect with folks. Uh, most of my uh, time is usually spent or leisure is, is on the weekends where I uh, will hang with a uh, girlfriend and dog. We have a small schnauzer. I mean, she's really tiny, <laughs> uh, she, maybe 13 pounds. Uh, her name is Nala and she is definitely a, a joy of uh, my life at this moment. And so on the weekends, we'll take her hiking uh, Santiago Canyon here in Anaheim, uh, or down the way in Anaheim, uh, and then down to the Laguna Dog Park and you name it. And then also we uh, do you know one or two big trips uh, a year, and that's kind of a little bit about myself. I tend to be uh, or geek out on all of the numbers here, and that keeps me rather busy. Um, without further ado, I think you guys have heard enough about myself. Let's uh, you know let's go ahead and get started on uh, what it is you came here for today. Uh, the actual presentation. So I'm going to click over to a different screen. For those of you who are on different devices, different platforms, uh, bear with us. Um, you should now see a presentation in the background. And if you don't, say you're on Instagram uh, or one of these other applications, uh, you know, it may not allow you to see it or it's too small there. Uh, I would say find your way over to YouTube. Uh, it's much easier to follow along with the presentation in the background. And so you should be seeing that now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, you know, today's discussion. So let's go ahead and fast forward through it. We'll see a couple of slides here. Let me just make sure this is coming over for us. Uh, you'll see a couple of slides here, kind of as an intro to the firm still. Uh, myself and uh, Tim, who is uh, an advisor here and helps out with uh, much of the plan building. Okay, there it is. Looks like we're rolling. All right, so go ahead and start a little more on the company here. Obviously, I, I think I've told you guys more than once that we're a retirement and tax wealth uh, company, so there they are. Some ancillary services I'll touch on uh, other than the classes, retirement income solutions, helping people understand how to distribute from their 401ks or the retirement savings. Uh, we have tax reduction strategists our strategies that we build with our uh, you know, tax repairs uh, internally. And then we have long-term care solutions for those of you who worry about uh, you know, medical beyond what Medicare would provide, right? You got a 70% chance of a long-term care need after the age of 65, many will depend on that. And it's one of the areas of weakness in most individual plans. 401k and IRA rollovers, if you need help managing your wealth, your investments, uh, even before retirement, that would be us. Um, so let's go ahead and move right along. Social Security, how critical is it? Well, it's very critical. As a matter of fact, 40% of current retirees are living off uh, you know, 100% of their Social Security benefit alone. And the other 60%, well, 40% of their income is derived from Social Security. If that doesn't drive the point home for you guys, let's go ahead and take a look at the lifetime value uh, of a Social Security benefit for someone who is collecting $2,000 per month. Well, that $2,000 over a 10-year stretch is about a quarter million dollars. If you didn't know, the average savings, retirement savings, of an individual who is 60 is about 175000 And so, you know, we can see that in that first 10 years, you have taken a benefit equal to what takes most people a lifetime to build. Now, moving on down to 15 years, about 400,000. Uh, we're going on half a million at 20 years, a little over half a million, really. And then at 25 years, which many of you will live uh, a 25 year retirement, 721,000. And so I think this speaks well to uh, how critical of a component Social Security is to your retirement. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the topics we'll be covering today. I'm gonna walk through the basic spousal benefits, the work penalty, determining your benefits, 
I'll jump over to taxation, where I've let you know that I spent plenty of time there. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and bring it all together. We'll do a Q&A and I'll let you guys on out of here. I'm going to try to get this done in 35, uh, 40 minutes. Okay, so bear with me. So first of all, everybody understands or should Social Security and how it works. During your working career, or your working life, you will pay tax, right? 6.2%. This is done through FICA, the Federal Insurance Compensation uh, Insurance is what it is. And, uh, excuse me, contribution insurance. And that's 6.2%. You see it come out of every check, bi-weekly, monthly, doesn't matter, unless you're a not working for a uh, non-covered employer, uh, like a you know some divisions of the government, you won't pay that tax. But for everybody else, uh, you will. And that goes into uh, the bank account, believe it or not. It's deposited right out, goes in from you and right out uh, into the uh, bank account of a retiree so they can enjoy uh, what they worked so hard for. And that is a continue, continuing cycle. Uh, and the people before you or the workforce before you, the same thing. And so uh, a couple things to keep in mind before you go out and um, file for your benefit. What you want to do is file three months before your expected start date. Now, if you decide to take early at the age 62, for example, you'll want to start three months before you turn 62 if you are, in fact, expecting to collect your first check at the age of 62, so in that first month. If you don't, and we've had this happen with many clients, if you don't, you won't receive, let's say you wait until you know uh, January 1st is your birthday, you're turning 62 and you wait to January 1st, well, you're not gonna be receiving your first check until like March. Um, and that can throw a curveball or a wrench in retirement for those of you who've already pulled the trigger on retirement from your employer, um, likely there not to allow you to come back. So just make sure you're three months early to this and you should be good to go. And that's again, uh, when you reach your first full month of attained age, attained age 62. Now, moving right along, um, although Social Security uh, and benefits, how they're uh, calculated, tend to be very, very complex. We have a, a YouTube video we've created on uh, the complex version. Um, we're going to keep it simple for you here. Uh, it's really consists of two parts, and the first is known as your primary insurance amount. And your primary insurance amount is your monthly retirement benefit at your normal retirement age. And your normal retirement age is really the second important component there. Now, your normal retirement age, again, depends on when, uh, excuse me, uh, when you were born. Okay, so if you were born from in that first row at the top there, we see 1943 to 1954. Anybody born within that range, your full retirement age is 66. So again, at that age 66, at your age 66, you are now entitled to 100% of your benefit, provided you didn't file early, right? Because if you filed early, this, that opportunity is gone. 1955, as we move uh, from each year up until uh, 1960, so 1955, we increment by two months, two, four, six, eight, 10. You'll see that uh, on the right side, 66 in two months for 1955, 66 in four months for 1956. The Social Security Administration uh, did this to overcome the fact that their projections were not uh, correct. And they do their best, that's for sure, but they didn't expect that medical advancements would allow people to live so long. You know, we're living a lot longer now than we ever have, and that age only uh, tend to increase. It just gets longer and longer and later and later. And so they have to make adjustments to the system now and again in order to uh, keep from uh, running out of benefits. Um, and so that is one of the ways they solve the problem. Down to 1960 and later, your full retirement age as of now is 67. I would anticipate that in the near future this changes, um, but this is what it is for now. Okay, moving right along, let's take a look at uh, somebody who wants to take their benefits early versus somebody who would take them later. So a $2,000 monthly benefit. If you file early at age 62, you're going to have a 25% reduction. 25%. And oftentimes when we were sitting with clients and helping them make this decision, you know, we try to, uh, you know, we try to recommend or uh, coach people into pushing off the decision to take Social Security benefits as long as they can because they really don't understand how long they're going to live and how they're going to depend, for how long they're going to depend on this benefit. 
Um, but you know, it's really about uh, an old illustration or example we'd give is if I or a cashier is standing there in front of a friend or cashier or whoever, and you've got 75 cents in your pocket, uh, excuse me, a dollar in your pocket, and they're offering you 75 cents as change for that dollar in exchange, right? I'll give you 75 cents for a dollar. Would you make that? Uh, would you make that transaction? And the answer is, of course you would not. Why would you possibly ever devaluate the dollar in your pocket for the 75 cents that your friend or cashier or whoever it is is offering? That is exactly what you're doing if you take early at 62. You've paid and made your contributions into the system for the last 25, 30, 35, 40 years by taking early you're giving away, it's another way to look at it, you're giving away 25% of what you paid in. Most people would not settle for that. Now, uh, at 66, it's, it, this is 100%. Again, this is an example for a person with their normal retirement age of 66, so born between uh, 1943 and 1954, they get 100%, so they get the full $2,000 benefit. Now, something we didn't mention earlier is that if you wait till age 70, they will give you an 8% simple interest increase based on your um, your primary insurance amount. I know that was a mouthful, but they'll only give you an 8%, they'll give you an 8% raise, we'll say it that way, every year uh, from your full retirement age to the age of 70, and that's it. They won't go or give you any more. They'll cut you at 70 and they'll kickstart your benefit. It's time to go. 132% for an individual uh, who got four years of that 8% increase and now their benefit is $2,640, so much, uh, much larger benefit. Uh, now, let's take a look at this for a few other uh, you know, age cases. So we had 66, we've done that. Um, let's move on to 66 in two months for someone born in 1955. Uh, now we'll see at their earliest of age 62, it's 74 and a half percent. So they've ticked down by about half a percent, right? They get a little less. They get uh, punished a little more for having been born later, so they're younger. So in this situation, we see already it pays to be older. <laughs> um, so moving right along uh, down to uh, maximum age of 70, it's 130 and a half percent. So we've lost about one and a half percent there. Now, uh, if you're curious about your age, uh, you will fall between uh, 1955 and 1960 if born after. Uh, 43 to 54, so you can see an example there on your left, and you'll just follow uh, the row over. So I'm going to jump down to 1960 and later, and it's uh, full retirement age of 67, as I stated earlier, uh, and now we see it early at age 62, it's 70 percent, so you're down by 5 percent. Again, it pays to be older, uh, and then all the way to the right side, maximum age 70, and we're looking at 124 percent, um, so down about 8% there. Okay, so that is primary insurance amounts. Let's go ahead and move on to, uh, you know, really when is the best time to start your benefits? This is a difficult decision to make. We see that if we wait, uh, we benefit with a, a higher uh, monthly benefit, right? And so many of us would like that, but we're also um, stuck in a dilemma because many of us wanna retire early and start that benefit that we're gonna depend on. So how can you get the most of birth best worlds? How can you delay? Well, it really, or can you delay? When should you take? And it really depends upon several factors. One is if you have other income resources, right? So if you have retirement savings that's adequate enough, well, you can retire at 62 like you want, um, but you can live off the retirement savings for the next four years and let your benefit grow. That could be a strategy for you. For you. We call that bridging the gap. Another one is if you're married. Now, there are surviving spouse, um, excuse me, spousal benefits that you can use as a strategy to increase the lifetime value of your, uh, you know, your retirement benefits coming from Social Security uh, that would allow you in the end uh, to receive a lifetime benefit that is just as much as uh, taking earlier or later. And I'll talk more on that uh, at, uh, you know, later on in the presentation. But if you're married, that can help. Um, or will, you know, that will kind of uh, help you base your decision. Now, uh, another one is if you'll continue to work. Well, if you continue to work, obviously you can pay for your expenses with your working income uh, and you won't have to take your social security benefit. And uh, lastly is if you expect to live a long life. And if you do expect to live a long life, 
how long will you have to live to recoup the benefits uh, you gave up when waiting? Okay, so again, kind of a long section there, uh, but bear with me. I'm going to jump to some examples with something we call a break-even analysis. So let me rephrase the question. People want to know if they're going to wait, if they're going to wait from 62 to, say, age 66, they're going to defer for four years. They're going to give up four years of their benefit. And so uh, at the age of 66, when they start their higher benefit, how long is it going to take to get back what they gave up in those first four years. And that is what we use the break even analysis for. Now, it comes in two flavors. There's a simple and complex, and we normally stick with simple uh, when doing webinars. Otherwise, we'll be here all day and uh, most of our eyes will be spinning. Um, it does get pretty deep. So anyways, let's make it simple. Um, you guys didn't spend 15 years in finance like I did, so it probably took me 15 years just to figure this one out. <laughs> Anyways, looking at the chart here, uh, we see um, if you delay, an individual was to delay their benefits to the age of 66. So they go void of benefit for four years, 62 to 66, and now they kick it on at 66. How long will it take? Well, at the age of 77, so 11 years. On the 11th year, you will have received back all of what you gave up for those four years. And then every month after that, you are now, uh, the decision for having delayed is benefiting you. We like that word around here, benefit, benefiting you. Okay, uh, it is 81 with COLA. I'll talk about COLA in just a moment. It pushes it out just a little further there. Now, moving on down to an individual who would delay till the age of 70. They really wanna get the max, uh, maximum out of the Social Security Administration. They've pushed it all the way to 70 and their break even is uh, one year less, it's 10 years. At the age of 80, they've in, broken even. And now every month that they get a benefit, it's much, much higher. And it is age 84 with COLA. And then moving on down, we have an individual who will continue to work till age 66, uh, and then they'll delay to 70, and their break even is 81. Uh, so that same 11 years we saw earlier on the top, and it's gonna be 86 with Cola. So again, to reiterate how this would work, if you were to um, give up your benefits, and let's say your benefit at age 62, like our example from earlier, we said 2,000 at age 66, we said 1,500 at age 62. Well, $1,500 per month over the course of a year, that's $18,000. 18 times four, last time I checked, would be $74,000. Uh, okay, so excuse me, $72,000, <laughs> uh, retirement specialist, right? Uh, $72,000. Now, how long will it take to get that $72,000 back I gave up? Well, at age uh, 66, if you waited, you'll get an additional $500 per month, right? You went from $1,500 to $2,000. You're at $2,000 now. That's an additional $500. Well, basic math tells us $500 a month times 12 is 6,000 and six. So it's basically 72,000 you gave up divided by that 6,000. So we can see that's about 10 or 11 years. So that is the break even analysis for you guys. Bank on about 10 to 11 years um, is what it will take to recoup what you gave up. Now I mentioned CPIW there or COLA, excuse me, there a second ago. COLA is known as a cost of living adjustment and it is no different than the raise you receive during your working year. It's synonymous. They are the same thing. You call it a raise in the workforce and we call it COLA in retirement. It is based on, both are based on, all of it's based on the CPIW, the consumer price index. And this is, uh, as an easy example, um, if you were to walk into a grocery store and fill up a shopping cart of goods and then one year later check out again and then compare the prices, you could create a percentage from that and that percentage is how much they'll raise your Social Security benefit by. That is in its most simplistic form. It's very uh, more, uh, you know, detailed nowadays. They use computer systems and a uh, pretty wild system for determining uh, CPIW. But in, in, in theory, that is how it works. That's how simple it really is. Now, moving right along, COLA is important to retirees because 
they want the increase. They know the cost of goods and services are rising every year. And the last thing you want is a situation where your income is here when you start retirement, your expenses here. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, if you're not receiving enough COLA, enough raise every year, but your expenses are growing at a faster pace, well, you could end up in a very bad situation, as you can see, where your expenses eclipse your income. Uh, and we've seen this happen to individuals, not with COLA, but in other areas for other reasons. And it's not a pretty picture. So uh, COLA, it's something you want to pay attention to. Every year it's uh, announced in October and it is based on third quarter to third quarter. And uh, important takeaway here, it is effective in January of the next year. So we've had clients thinking, oh, well, I'll spend a little more this month in November because I'll have it. Uh-uh, it's not coming until January of the following year. Uh, COLA 2021 was 1.3%, 1 so not bad. We're anticipating inflation right around the corner here with everything that's gone on over this last year and a half, two years. Uh, but as of now, it's 1.3. And regardless of what inflation moves to, uh, CPIW should capture that, and that should be reflected in your COLA change. Now, moving along to COLA over time, this is kind of a cool snapshot uh, from 1975 all up into 2021. So we've got 35, 40 years there of, of COLA. And so if you look back in 1975, we can see, you know, 8%. That was pretty high, right? So inflation was much higher back then, and, and so was COLA. And so we see that it was pretty high all the way down through the, uh, you know, late 80s. And uh, then also, uh, well, not also, but then through the 90s, we saw it uh, kind of tick back quite a bit. We were like, uh, you know, between 3 and 5%. And then we got into the 2000. We hovered there for quite a while. In 2010 and onward, it really came down. And we've been floating uh, right around, let's see, uh, uh, from 75 to 2020, 3.66%. And then right around the last 10 years, about 1.92%. But again, the cost of price, uh, the cost of goods and services has, has risen by these same two amounts. As a matter of fact, in one of our presentations, uh, we demonstrate that uh, COLA has outpaced inflation over time. This is a good thing. Uh, we don't know if that'll continue into the future, but over time, historically, it has by roughly, uh, you know, by roughly 50 basis points. Okay, normally you hear inflation 3%. We're seeing 3.66% here. Now, moving right along to spousal benefits. There may be a benefit if you're married. Well, look at that. Stay married, right? So it is based upon, so as far as the spouse goes, it is based upon uh, either their own earning history or it is based upon their spouse's earning history. So it is one or the other, not both. Um, now, as far as eligibility is concerned, you must be married one full year immediately before application. So get out there and get married if you're not. Uh, and you must be at least uh, age 62 and your working spouse, the one that your benefit will be based on, must have filed an application for their benefits. So they have already needed to uh, been collecting their benefits and you will go ahead and claim your spousal benefits based on that. The reason is because it's calculated based on their benefit amount and we don't know what their benefit amount is until they file. So moving right along, looking at an example here at an ages, uh, at a spouse's age 62, uh, the benefit amount that the percentage they'll give you of the worker spouse benefit is 32.5%. I'll get to an example in just a minute. Bear with me. Uh, if it's at the, uh, if it's at your full retirement, at the spouse's full retirement age, excuse me, then it is 50%. Okay, so moving right down to an example, if we have a $2,000 benefit, that is the worker's benefit based on their normal retirement age. So this worker of yours was born between 43 and 54. And so their normal retirement age is 66. They're gonna get a $2,000 benefit. We're using the same example here. Uh, they, at your age of 62, if you filed at 62 so early, a spousal benefit, right? You're the spouse that maybe didn't work. Maybe you were a homemaker and this could be male or female, uh, but you're now filing for a spousal benefit based on the worker spouse. You get 32 and percent at your age of 62. Okay. Actually, I will say a note here. This just recently moved down. This is one of the ways the social security, a method they're using to correct the system because they're anticipating, um, you know, in, there's there's an exhaustion date for the Social Security Trust. Um, so they've ticked this down to 32.5%. 
used to be 35% as of last year and prior. Now, looking at the uh, your, you filing as the spouse who did not work uh, at your full retirement age. So let's pretend you were born, uh, your full retirement age 67, you're born after uh, 1960. Uh, well, it would be $1,000 then. But pretty nice uh, nonetheless because you will receive a benefit regardless if you file at uh, 62 early or later at your full retirement age uh, of 67. And again, important here is that your worker spouse, the one uh, who this is based on, has to file for a benefit and they have to be at least their normal retirement age. Now, um, keep in mind as a note here, uh, it does not exceed, will not exceed 50%. We saw it take back there on the left side, uh, but it's uh, never been greater than 50% and supposedly it never will be greater than 50%. Okay, so at your full retirement age. Now, moving right along, a couple other things to know. Upon the first uh, first death of a married couple, the surviving spouse will retain the larger of the two benefits, but not both. And see, when we're building retirement plans for folks, oftentimes uh, an area where folk get into trouble is that we will simulate uh, an early or a premature death of a spouse, and they lose a large percentage of their income from the pension side, and the Social Security side, right? And uh, I will mention, your expenses will not reduce uh, typically as much as your income will at the death of a spouse. Usually our expenses will drop about 10 to 15%, but oftentimes we see income drop by as much as 50%. So just a little note there from a retirement planner. Uh, moving right along, divorced spouses are eligible for a benefit as well. You heard it right. Divorced spouses may receive a benefit if they're at least 62 and currently unmarried. Okay, so big key there, stay unmarried until you get your benefit going. And then you must have been married for at least 10 years and divorced for at least two years. 10 years, two years, that's the rule, 10-2. Okay, and then lastly, um, you're not eligible for equal or higher benefits based upon your own earning record or other prior spouses. You can't take both, right? You just get one or the other. If you had a work history, um, they would base your benefit off of that. Uh, but if you're divorced and you meet these qualifications and you don't have a work history, well, then you may be entitled to a benefit. Always reach out to the Social Security Administration to verify. Now, moving right along, uh, something to keep in mind, your ex-spouse does not have to claim benefits in order to file for spousal benefit. That's pretty sweet. We saw earlier, if you are married, um, they do have to file. But if you're divorced, it's a little different. Okay, so moving right along to restricted application. This is a strategy that married couples can use in order to increase the lifetime value of their Social Security benefit. Now, when I say lifetime value, in the beginning of this uh, presentation, I was showing you guys, you know, how things would look over 10, 20, 25 years or so. We as retirement planners tend to see the big picture, and that's what I mean. Sometimes what appears to be um, you know, very luring in the earlier years of the decision making may not be when you look at the very big picture. And that's why for us, it's always better to take a look at the lifetime value of these things and the reason that I use the word. So moving right along, again, this is a, um, a, a, a strategy we use or implement for married couples it's called restricted application. How does it work or when do we use it? Uh, when both spouse have attained their normal retirement age. What's your normal retirement age? If we were in a seminar, I'd be uh, calling on hands. Uh, usually we hand out Starbucks gift cards too, so people tend to put their hands up pretty quick. <laughs> uh, anyways, normal retirement age is the age at which you will receive 100% of your benefit, 100% of your retirement benefit from Social Security that you're entitled to for having paid in those contributions, 6.2% for the last 35, 40 years, right? That is your normal retirement age. It's based on your date of birth. Okay, if you're both born before between 1943 and 1954, it would be age 66. So, you're both age 66. Income is needed or desired. Well, income is always needed and desired, uh, but we'll move right on. Check. Goal is to continue to grow the lesser benefit to age 70. So, this is where now you're kind of getting a glimpse at what it is, what it means. You're both at that age and one of you get the opportunity to delay your benefits so that it can grow up to that max at age 70. 
Okay, uh, moving right along. Let's see it. Let's see the concept. So spouse with larger benefit claims full benefits. I'm giving you guys a visual here to help settle it in. It's easier with visuals. Spouse with larger benefit claims their full benefits. Okay, so you got to figure out who's going to have the larger benefit. That's easy. We call the Social Security Administration or we log online and we look at that and then we determine who files first. You go ahead and file. And so now they're taking that income, right? And the spouse with the lower benefit files for what they call a restricted application. The Social Security Administration is familiar with this terminology. We will call them and we'll say, we want the restricted application and they will set it up for us. Okay, and so they will take, um, they will file and suspend there or they will restrict their applications. Uh, but what they'll do is simultaneously file for the spousal benefit, right? We said earlier, you can file for a spousal benefit at your normal retirement age and get 50% of your spouse, the one who filed, the one with the bigger benefits, benefit. Okay, so moving right along. Let's look at like a real life example. Uh, we have Mona here and Mona is age 66, her full retirement age, and she's going to get a $2,000 monthly benefit. So that's now coming into the household. But then we have Rob and Rob, his own benefit is $1,500 per month, but he wants that benefit to grow. He wants it to be larger in the future. So what does he do? So he goes ahead and files a restricted application allowing that $1,500 to grow. And in the meantime, he gets 50% of Mona's benefit. He gets $1,000 a month. He gets $1,000 a month while his benefit grows to his full retirement uh, or maximum retirement uh, age of 70. And now guess what? That $1,500 has turned into $1,980. He's up $480 every single month for the rest of his life. And in the meantime, he collected $1,000. He didn't have to go void of a benefit. He got a benefit. He claimed a spousal benefit. So that is how restricted application works. And remember, only one uh, member of a married couple can file for it. Now, will this work for you? So really, that depends upon your total retirement income picture, your ages, your benefit amounts. There's a lot that goes into it. And what we do is we recommend you guys, well, reach out to a retirement planner. One of the reasons we put on these webinars is so that you guys can see the need uh, for a retirement planner such as ourselves, and then you reach out to us for that service. Okay, so anyways, that's what you can do to figure out if it will work for you. Now, there's also something known in our industry as the work penalty, and people don't like that word. They don't like penalty. Nobody does. Nobody likes penalty, and nobody likes fees. <laughs> nobody likes taxes, neither. Um, so, Social Security rules impose a benefit penalty if you decide you want to collect your benefit and continue working, and it doesn't matter if you want to work part time or full time, they want to penalize you. OK, so moving on, let's take a look at what it means. If you elect to begin your benefit early prior to attaining your normal retirement age, that's what when this applies. OK, before your full retirement age, if you take your benefit and you continue working, the rule implies. Continue, and if you continue to earn income while receiving early retirement benefits. Well, we know that, right? You're working and collecting an income, you're taking your benefits, and you haven't turned your full retirement age yet. Now, working generally, uh, it means a couple of different types of earned income. Earned income is the key here, and it doesn't normally include pensions, investment income, um, and annual income. Uh, you know, generally, you know, annuity income, excuse me, these types don't generally apply towards the rule. The rule. So oftentimes what we do for folks is uh, we'll set things up in a way that they can receive income from those vehicles and avoid the penalty. But moving right along, self-employment, commissions, fees, and even in some cases, passive income from a privately held small business may count. Mostly what they're looking for is earned income, right? You're working for an employer. They're giving you a W-2. That is earned income. Okay, so uh, moving right along, work penalty only applies for earned income prior to reaching normal retirement age. I say this over and over again because it's important. Once you reach your full retirement age, after that full retirement age, boom, it's gone. You can work as many hours as you want. You can earn as much income as you'd like and no penalty applies. Okay, I've said it. Uh, no penalty attained. So it's in there a few times. Again, I, I tend to be redundant in our classes because we want, you know, some, there are some pieces we want to stick with you guys. 
There is something, though, known as the exempt amount. And the exempt amount is the maximum that you can earn, the maximum earned income you can uh, receive every year uh, without facing that work penalty. And it's a little confusing, but we'll make it as simple as we can. So first of all, if you are work, you took your benefits at 62 and you continue to work and you're not yet 66, right? So this is before your normal retirement age. The exempt amount is 18,960. This is 2021 figures updated. Thank you, Tim. Uh, moving on to, excuse me, uh, moving on to below that, we'll see the benefit penalty is a dollar in benefits withheld for every $2 over the exempt amount. It is a 50% penalty is what it is. It's rather high. Uh, now moving to the right, in the year that normal retirement age is attained, it's $50,520 and it's $1 for every $3. So about a 30% penalty there. Now it moves up until you reach. So let's say your, your date of birth is later in the year. Well, you'll have that penalty applied to you throughout the year. And then when you turn that age, it's gone. Okay, so moving right along to an example, right? Let's give you guys a visual. Mary, she begins her benefits at the age of 62 in 2020. She's 62. She's taking a $20,000 Social Security benefit, and she also has $40,000 of earned income. So earned income is the number we're going to focus on here. So $40,000 of earnings minus the exempt amount, right? She's not yet her full retirement age. She's 62. So she has a much smaller exempt amount of 18000 960. When you subtract that from the 40,000, she is over the exempt amount by $21,000. That's a lot. And what did we learn? That if she's over by 21,000, 50% of that is subject to a penalty. Her penalty amount is $10,520. And guess where it's going to come from? It's going to come from your social security benefits. As a matter of fact, this is dangerous. We've seen this happen with one or two clients before. The Social Security Administration, like the IRS and any other governmental agency, and excuse me for any of those who work for one, uh, bless your hearts, uh, tend to be behind. Uh, you know, they're usually about two years behind on processing. And that means that they're not going to catch that penalty for quite some time. That also means that they're going to hold, they're going to hold all of your social security benefit. They're not going to give you a partial benefit. They're going to hold, they're going to stop your benefit until that penalty is paid. And you can see that for 40% of, uh, you know, retirees living on uh, social security alone, this could cause some problems. Well, they wouldn't be living on social security alone because they'd have work, you know, earned wages here, but you get the picture. So this could cause an issue for folks, right? It could put a stop right in the middle of receiving uh, the income you're dependent on in retirement. So again, we advise if you plan to file for benefits while working, speak to an advisor before doing so, so you can figure uh, how much your penalty will be and withhold that for the administration. Okay, so moving right along, determining your benefits. How can you do it? How do you find out today how much you're entitled to? What about tomorrow? What about if you earn more? Well, there's a way to do that. So first of all, um, there are two options. They used to mail an annual statement. They don't do that anymore because um, they're trying to be paper conscious and also the cost is high, right? Uh, Social Security Online Retirement Estimator is the one that we use and there are a few different ones. There's a quick estimator. Um, it's very simple but not so accurate. Uh, and then there is a, um, a retirement estimator which uh, it's somewhat accurate, but doesn't use your work history. And then you can log in and, and use an estimator in inside of the Social Security Administration website. And that one's the most accurate. It's actually based on your, your working history, your, your, your work record, because they have that in their database. Okay, which is the one that we uh, usually recommend. So you can find all that at ssa.gov. Uh, I'm going to show you guys what the statement looks like. You've probably seen one of these before, no doubt. And they usually give you three options. You have the top, your full retirement age. So uh, if you wait, uh, 70, if you go the long haul, and then early at 62, if you want to give 25% of your contributions away. Uh, moving on down, one thing we mentioned here is because you're not getting any other examples or scenarios other than those three, 
uh, it's a reason why we continue to recommend using the online retirement estimator tool because it's more accurate uh, and it's easy to use, first of all. Um, but you can go in there and you can create scenarios, you know, such as, oh, hey, well, um, you know, maybe, maybe I want to retire uh, at 63 or 64 and I probably get a raise in the meantime, right? You can plug that in there and then it will give you an accurate estimate of your benefits based on those figures at 64 with income that's maybe 10% higher because it's a couple of years later. Okay, so uh, moving right along, if you guys would like, we do have a fully illustrated instruction manual for how to go out and do that. Uh, just reach out to us for that. It'll walk you through the process. Although I'd say if you visit the site, you probably figure it out on your own. Uh, now, moving right along as a last or final piece to this section, uh, there are a couple of different things you might want to be uh, careful of if you have uh, work for, if you have pensions or work for the government. Um, so first of all, your social security, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I'm kind of moving in here to see this a little better because the print is so fine. Uh, but your social security benefit uh, or your statement may be reduced if you earn a pension outside the social security system. Uh, okay, so if you've got a pension, there's something called windfall elimination provision where it's kind of a, a they call it the two thirds rule. So it's pretty much uh, if you take two thirds uh, of your pension and you subtract it from your social security benefit, uh, if there's a positive there, many of these folks won't get a social security benefit, um, right? Because they're stating you have enough to live on. You don't need uh, social security, which I think is ludicrous. I would agree with you because you work hard for both sides. Uh, generally, this affects government uh, and state or local municipality and even federal jobs. So typically, again, this only apply to those individuals. And to give you an example, this is more so for someone that went out and worked maybe their first 10 years. They got their 40 credits. Um, so, you know, they, um, you know, they, they, they've met, uh, they're eligible for their Social Security benefits. Um, but then they work the next 30 years, say, for the federal government, the post office, for example. Now they get to retirement and they're saying, wait, I had 10 years of working, I, I paid my dues, I'm entitled to both. Well, the government uh, or Social Security says, uh-uh, we want to take a look at how much you're receiving from your pension first. They'll do this two-thirds rule. And if there's too much coming from the pension, for instance, if you're getting 5000 from the pension, uh, you know, 60% of that I think would be 3500 Well, if your benefit's $2,000, they subtract it, it's 1500 unfortunately, that person won't be getting a, a, a Social Security benefit. Okay, again, this only apply typically to governmental employees. And if you need help figuring uh, if that applies to you, reach out to us. Income that does not, uh, is not withheld from Social Security taxes. Uh, it's income that did not uh, withhold, yeah, Social Security taxes. And then lastly, if the amount of reduction uh, to the uh, Social Security is based on the number of years of work inside the social security system okay so again windfall elimination can be a little confusing um, so you're more than welcome to reach out to us uh, for more on that here we see the government pension offset um, that is for somebody that has a spouse it's for the surviving spouse of someone who worked for the government and you see the two-thirds rule applied there as well again these are things you just want to pay close attention to because they can inhibit or uh, reduce or even eliminate your social security benefit. Um, so this is just another version uh, uh, of the windfall elimination uh, provision. Again, reach out to us if you guys have questions on that. You're more than welcome to ask questions at the end of uh, this webinar today. Now, moving on to taxation. Uh, I know that all of you are so excited to talk about taxes, especially in the current environment. We have the Biden uh, plan coming forth and everybody's still trying to figure that out. It looks as though it's going to hit uh, individuals over $400,000 per year and earn income more so than those under, uh, but we'll, we'll look and see, right? We'll check the fine print, won't we? Uh, so anyways, looking at taxation as it is today uh, for those who are collecting Social Security benefits, uh, first of all, is it going to be taxed? People want to know. Am I going to pay tax on my Social Security? And if I am, how much? Well, it depends on something called your combined income. And that combined income is a compilation 
uh, or a total of your adjusted gross income plus non-taxable interest, which is like municipal bond interest, uh, you thought it would go tax-free. Haha, -ha. they'll always find a way uh, to get theirs. Anyways, moving on, it's half of your benefits. So if you take the three of those and combine them, it's your combined income. Now, if you are married, finally and joint, and you have a combined income between 32,000 and 44,000, then your benefit, your social security benefit, up to 50% of it will be taxable. So some people think, oh my gosh, 50% of my benefit is I gotta pay in tax. It's not like the work penalty, for example, this is different. Okay, what that means is if you had a $10,000, let's say your social security benefit to make it easy for the year is $10,000 and you, your combined income was between 32 and 44,000. It just means that $5,000, right, 50% of the 10,000 will be added to your income to be run through the tax tables. So it ends up just being a percentage of that that you pay tax, right? It's gotta go through those tax tables from zero to, you know, a 10,000, you pay 10%, from 10,000 to 20,000, you pay 12%, so on and so forth. It's just a small percentage of that, so it's not, you're not giving 50% of your benefit in tax. Important to note. Uh, for those of you over $44,000 in combined income that are married, it's up to 85%. So $8,500 would be added towards or run through those tax tables. Now, if you're individual filing, uh, an individual filer, it's $25,000 to $34,000. That's up to 50%. And then from $34,000 on up, it is 85%. Now that is it for uh, taxation. I don't want to go too far into the into the weeds of, of taxes because it can get rather uh, confusing quickly. You guys are more than welcome to join the class I host on retirement and taxes where I do go a little deeper and I do touch on Social Security with examples. Um, so again, I would uh, recommend you guys just click on the link when you see it coming through uh, the email notifications. Anyways, uh, now that we're kind of nearing the end, we all probably agree, hopefully you guys would agree that Social Security, uh, first of all, it's rather important. It's a big component of retirement, usually make up 40%, if not more, of a retiree's income, but also that it can be rather cumbersome to make the right choice. Making the right choice, let me say it this way too, the decision you make around Social Security is once in a lifetime. People are so fast to go out there and make the decision to take their benefits today, uh, only to find out later they should have waited. We have people coming into our class asking us all the time, what can we do to go backwards? You can't. Uh, you know. So the only way to go back, I will say there's one way. If within a year of collecting your benefits, you decide uh, that that wasn't the right decision, you can pay back you can retro, you can pay back everything you've collected, which most of us just wouldn't have lying around, but you can pay back everything you've collected and you can ask uh, the Social Security kindly if they would reconsider you, uh, you know, delaying your benefit. And mostly they would approve. And I've seen this done very, very few times, but that's the only time. Outside of that year, it is it. And you got to hope that you made the right decision because the decision you make, you are now living with. So what we do is we challenge people that come into our classes, that come into our webinars and seminars to slow down just a little bit and make the right decision. Spend a little time talking to a professional, somebody that's been doing it for 15 years, someone that's been doing it for longer than I have or we have. It doesn't matter. Seek some help. Reach out to a professional. Get some help. Let them decide or help you decide and guide you um, to the best decision for you along you know for the long haul and so uh, what we do here is to to help you guys to offer that hand of service uh, we provide what's called a complimentary retirement checkup and you can take advantage of that offer by clicking on the link in the right hand side of the screen there should be a comment section there and uh and wow am i seeing it here i don't oh i do see the link the link is there up at the top it says calendly dot com sunpath financial click on the link 
do it now. I'm going to sound like Ronco from the infomercials that they would play late at night. You know, uh, we got to come up with a better deal here. <laughs> uh, you know, if you call in and you order in the next five minutes, yada, yada. But what we're saying is take advantage of the offer because it's going to help you guys not only clarify the decision around when you should take your Social Security and what your benefit amount will be and if you can apply a spousal strategy, um, but we'll also do more. We do a lot more in the retirement checkup. We help you look at all income sources, all expense sources, assets and liabilities, and we provide you a, a plan, a checkup, your progress towards retirement. Are there going to be problems that you'll face along the way, right? And if there are, what can you do to avoid them? All right, so that is what the checkup is going to help you do. It is your progress towards retirement today. It is a checkup. Are you ready to retire? Um, and so if you click on that link, we will go ahead and get you started. It's your first name, last name, email, phone number, um, and then you just simply choose a date and time. And myself or one of the other advisors here will reach out to you and we will begin a 15, 20 minute conversation collecting your income expenses, assets and liabilities. And within a week, we'll have a plan for you, right? A professional plan uh, for you, ready to go, helping you look at all the big problems and, and how to overcome them. Okay, another thing I'll say to you guys too, as far as, and a lot of people come and say, oh, we have an advisor. Oh, we have several advisors. I hear that all the time. We have three advisors. <laughs> what, what are they all doing? You should only have really one advisor. Um, and for us, uh, you know, if you're moving into retirement, if you're really close, uh, it would do you well to have a retirement advisor, right? The majority of advisors out there, the one you've been working with your whole life, He's usually really good at one thing, and that's accumulating assets, asset accumulation. That's what they know. Fidelity, Charles Schwab, these big banks, Wells Fargo advisors. These guys are good at one thing, and that's accumulating assets. They don't, the, the planning side's not for them. Retirement's not for them. That's just distribution, accumulation, distribution. We work on the distribution side. We help folks identify investment vehicles that have the highest level of safety with the max level of income. This is much, much different. Beside that, we build a plan that encases, uh, that that's encased by, right? And answers all of those problem areas for you. And again, that comes with quarterly uh, conversations. When prospects become clients of our firms, uh, we actually call them and we follow up with reports every quarter to help them understand that progress. Um, and that is an ongoing relationship which we hold close to. And so we would uh, invite you guys to fill out your information, to get your checkup, to see if, again, um, this would be something for, uh, you know, there's a potential for a relationship down the road, but your checkup nonetheless. I'm going to go ahead and jump to a Q&A at this time. It looks like we've got a couple questions waiting for us already. And so let's do that. Um, I'm going to click over here. Grab my iPad if you guys don't mind, and we'll see what we've got going. All right, so the first question up is from Raj. Can you share the link of that federal retirement book? Ah, yes, Raj, no problem. Uh, I will follow up. I will have Lauren follow up with a link. Lauren is our full-time assistant here. She will follow up Lauren Stone. So look out for emails coming from L Stone or Lauren Stone. Um, uh, emails from her uh, with that link, Raj. And anybody else who would like a copy of the book, uh, no problem. Can the higher earner file for restricted spousal benefit instead of the lower earner illustrated? F question from Frank Y. Can uh, Frank Y. Sorry, uh, Frank, don't know your last name there, but Frank Y. is what I'm seeing here. Frank, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> Simply put, um, it is always going to be the lower income earner or the lower, the, the individual with the lower benefit. You know, years ago, this was different. As a matter of fact, they allowed you to do this re restricted application called file and suspend before turning your full retirement age. Things were good back then um, since, uh, you know, things have changed. And we know why, right? Uh, one of the questions I'm seeing coming from uh, on the Instagram feed of all places is, is the Social Security Administration in trouble? And, uh, that conversation, uh, that question uh, for us could probably go on forever. Um, so I'll make it as easy as I can. Personally, we don't think that we, so there's some challenges there. There is a trust um, and that trust is set to, ex 
to exhaust here in the next 10 years or so. You know, for the longest time, it was set to exhaust in 2035 and then 2020, so it's like 2032 and now it's 2029. It keeps coming back. And much of that has to do with the stimulus that's been injected into the economy uh, over this last year and a half, right? We have, I don't know, we're going on, what, four or five billion dollars worth of stu- stimulus. And, uh, and so, you know, all of that, like when you look at the government, um, you know, all, the revenue is generated from GDP. It's a multiple of GDP. So you have your gross domestic product, which is, you know, what we as a country produce here in goods and services. And the government says, I would like a piece of that through taxes, right? Um, and that tax revenue uh, is, you know, about 3.5, uh, you know, trillion per year. Uh, but on the other side of that, we have our expenses, Right. And those expenses, well, this last year, about six, six, a little over six uh, trillion. So we're in a a big deficit. Most years we've run into deficit, by the way. Um, And that is where our debt comes from. We run into deficit and the the debt continues to increase and increase and increase. The reason I bring it up is because when we're looking at our expenses, it's cut into a pie and we have Social Security and we have Medicare and medical and we have defense. Those are kind of the three big areas. And Social Security is in the 20 percentile, you know, it's in the 20s as far as a percentage. I think it's 23 percent. Medicare is right around that range. And we only see Social Security becoming more expensive, honestly. Uh, And the reason is because people are living longer. Medical advancements, as stated earlier, are allowing us to live into our 80s and even 90s. You got a one in two chance uh, as a married couple of uh, living to 92, they say. And that was a few years ago I heard that uh, statistic, so I'm sure it's, it's, it's longer now. That was like on the Times um, Magazine front cover. Um, and so, you know, really what ends up happening is as that becomes more and more expensive, the Social Security, that, that, that fund tend to exhaust. Uh, and that's why this is happening. People are living longer, um, and so you know, the, the exhaust, the, 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 that fund is exhausting much faster. Um, now when it does exhaust though, the social security has projections stating that they will be able to pay up to 80% of benefits in perpetuity. And so, which means forever. Um, now obviously their projections, uh, in the past have not been correct. Um, so you wonder how, when they say 80% in perpetuity, uh, how valid that really, that statement really is. But the point I'm trying to make is that if, if the, if the, when the uh, trust exhausts, it does not mean that your benefits will stop. That is a, uh, usually that's a misconception by a lot of clients. And it really is used by financial advisors to, to, to scare as a scare tactic to get clients to speak with them. Oh my gosh, social security is going to exhaust. What are you going to do? You better talk to me. Um, but when it exhausts, there will, there will still be a large workforce out there paying tax to cover those benefits, and that's where that 80% comes from. Now, where they'll make up the 20% is at question, right? And so when, when someone asks, is the administration in trouble, uh, I think for us, the question is, where is that 20% going to come from when the trust does exhaust? And we don't believe it's going to come from uh, current uh, beneficiaries, so those who are collecting a benefit, retirees, we don't think it'll come from there. Because again, 40% of those individuals, 100% of their income is from that benefit. So they, and that's the federal poverty level. And they'd push them further into poverty, which we don't think is possible. And then the other 60% is living on 40%, um, 40% of their income is from that, you know, from the Social Security Administration. And so we don't see it coming from, it would push them into that level, right? At least one down. So we don't see it coming from there. We see it coming from other adjustments. We see it coming from uh, FICA taxes going from 6.2%, maybe up to six and a half, maybe 7%. We calculated at one time, if you moved it up to 8%, roughly 8%, it would solve the 20% right off the bat. So you could just get away, get, you know, you can get around the 20% right there. But we think it'll come from a combination of increased taxes from FICA. We think that that's, um, you know, when they incremented uh, your age, uh, you know, the full retirement age, we think that they're going to push that back. Um, so instead of 66 from 43 to 54, you know, um, maybe that becomes something like 67. Or for anybody born after 1970, 
uh, you know, it would be it would be later. So we see them making those types of adjustments. We don't see them making adjustments to current beneficiaries. Um, so yeah, uh, we have something else here from Frank. Can we have the PowerPoint? Yeah, Frank, no, no problem. We can send you the PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, just getting back to that real quick. It, in the end, we don't think the administration is in trouble, at least the way the media presents it. Uh, we do believe that if we continue down this path, we will exhaust the trust fund. Uh, but again, 80% would be paid by the workforce, provided we have a healthy workforce. Uh, those beneficiaries should be fine. And you should expect um, that in taxes increase and that full retirement age get pushed off and maybe even the early early retirement age of 62 that may get lifted as well and so those are some of the things they can do to make adjustments to keep the system alive uh, any other questions let me take a look here at the feed all right um, it looks like that is going to be it for today uh, we're running at 12.08 here, so a little bit over. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. For those of you uh, who have tuned in across the different devices and channels that we have, um, that we have, and uh, we do appreciate your support for uh, you know prospects who have tuned in multiple times and even clients. Thank you so much. As we continue our journey here to uh, build this retirement planning and wealth management company and provide you guys uh, the best in education on uh, those five core uh, retirement components. Thank you guys so much. And we look forward to seeing you in the next event. We will be sending emails for that um, should be, if not tomorrow, then earlier next week. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you in the future.